stratification now. Um, risk stratification, I think, is very sort of resonant with surgeons because I found you guys always think about risk stratification, but endocrinologists didn't always think this way. So I'm going to show you what I showed to the endocrinologist and sort of all the groups that we talk about and really frame it in terms of where we started. So I started my endocrine fellowship in the last century. Holy cow. I wish that was a joke. It's not. So I started that in 1990. Um, and when I was doing my fellowship in 1990, risk stratification really revolved around just one time point right after surgery. Um, we didn't, the endocrinologist didn't think about it before surgery. Remember, this was the time of very masiferi influence, everybody getting total thyroidectomy, everybody getting radioactive iodine. So once you had a diagnosis of thyroid cancer, you just had your surgery and your radioactive iodine at most places. And the only risk stratifications that were really out there was the AJCC system that honestly most of us didn't use and the MESA system that some people used from the Mayo Clinic. But the trouble was those were single time point estimates. They didn't change over time. They didn't really predict the risk of recurrence. And the vast majority of patients I was dealing with, I didn't worry about them dying from thyroid cancer. They were 20 and 30 and 40 year olds with papillary thyroid cancers and lymph node metastasis. And recurrence was the issue in them, not so much uh, the risk of dying. It really didn't give us any information about perioperative or preoperative risk assessment. And if we were honest, most stage four patients didn't really die. And a few stage two and stage threes died. So it didn't really help us. Now, if I fast forward to where we are right now, we still have that same continuum of how a patient uh, presents with thyroid cancer. But our risk stratification model now begins as soon as we find a suspicious nodule. This idea that not everybody gets one size fits all and not everybody gets a total thyroidectomy, but rather there are candidates for minimalistic management. And we have to identify those as soon as we see the nodule and make decisions about biopsy and the extent of surgery. And then of course, after surgery, we are gonna risk stratify because the interoperative findings and preoperative findings and path reports will all inform sort of how we start this journey and I'll show you using the TNM system that I actually like now and the ATA risk system that we'd worked on in the past. And then what happens is at each visit during follow-up, we readjust what their risks are. And I'll show you what that looks like over time, but we've come from 1990 where there was one single point time point risk assessment, now to the point where we are risk assessing and adapting our processes in a dynamic, iterative, active process, no matter where we are in the course of the patient. That then allows us to not only do the right initial therapy, but the right early follow-up and then the right long-term follow-up. Now, the, I stole this periodiagnostic language from the pulmonary doctors because we're all used to it. You know, you do a CT scan for some other reason, you find a non-specific small pulmonary nodule, right? And so the pulmonary doctors have to decide which one do we biopsy, which one do we watch, how do we make that decision? And in their language, they call that periodiagnostic risk assessment. And that felt like what we were doing with thyroid nodules, that it's the same situation. We find these asymptomatic nodules and we have to decide questions like, is it necessary to do an FNA? Um, we ask questions like, is an FNA really necessary or is it potentially harmful? Can we hurt somebody? Not, not with the needle, but making an 80-year-old a cancer patient, I'm not certain, is probably in his best interest. We ask questions like, is immediate surgery necessary? Is, is there a role for observation? Um, that risk stratification helps you understand, should you do a lobectomy? Should you do a total thyroidectomy? Or these days, radiofrequency ablation or microwave or lasers? And what we're really asking in this early diagnostic assessment is, are you, is the patient a candidate for a minimalistic management approach? That's what we're asking up front, making that decision. Here's a classic example, real case. 78-year-old female, um, she had the incidental finding of an asymptomatic thyroid nodule. She was getting a carotid ultrasound or something like that. And they found a five millimeter thyroid nodule the control lobe is absolutely normal. There's no abnormal lymph nodes at all. And I think we have to ask questions like, is an FNA necessary? Now, in the past, the guidelines had said if it's smaller than five millimeters, you don't have to do a biopsy. 
the world was fine with that for many years. And then when we wrote, when we raised it to 10 millimeters instead of five millimeters, we created this entire wave of what do you mean you're not diagnosing thyroid cancer? Um, because we said, we're not certain making a diagnosis of cancer in a 78 year old has helped this lady. Even if you choose to watch, she's going to have to come back to the hospital every six months for some ultrasounds and then follow up. She's going to behave as a cancer patient. No matter how much we say, this is a little small cancer, don't worry about it. It changes their life. It changes how they make decisions. Um, you know, I would suspect most of us now at a 78-year-old with this sort of presentation would probably give them the option of watching. Um, but if you think 10 years ago, we were taking incredible grief for not rushing these patients to surgery at a minimum doing a lobectomy. But fortunately, we've changed that way. And I think most people that wanted to do a surgery now would probably offer a lobectomy and would say, yeah, this is a classic example of somebody that's a minimalistic management. Now, as we began to think about who would be good candidates for minimalistic management, JP Brito was with me at the time. He was one of my thyroid cancer fellows, is now an endocrinologist at the Mayo Clinic doing great. But when we looked at the first 50 patients that we were thinking about watching, uh, these were papillary microcarcinomas, and we were not going to do a surgery, um, we realized we were looking at sort of three different characteristics. It wasn't just every papillary microcarcinoma. There were certainly tumor characteristics, but there were also medical team characteristics. I was seeing people that were going to fly back to Europe or fly back to South America and do their observation there. Um, and then there were difference in patient characteristics that we'll talk about in a minute. And we said, look, if we take if we look at all three of those realms, we can classify somebody as either ideal, appropriate, or inappropriate for a minimalistic management approach. And so with Akira Miyachi, uh, who really started all this work in Japan many, many years ago, was very kind and sort of helped us think through this process and how we could apply this to the United States. We started out by saying, OK, there'll be Bethesda 6 or Bethesda 5 <clears throat> if you've got a highly suspicious ultrasound. Um, if you got the V600E mutation, we know that's a papillary cancer. We'll watch that. Uh, we were OK with watching things up to one and a half centimeters because there's absolutely nothing biologic about one centimeter. Um, humans have 10 fingers, and so we tend to do 10 millimeters, decades of 10, 10 year survival. It has nothing to do with science. Guess what? If we had 11 fingers, papillary microcarcinoma would have been 11 millimeters. Um, so we raised it up to 1.5 centimeters, and that seems to be okay. Acceptable features, we had to accept some background Hashimoto's, some multi-nodular gorder, otherwise there'd be nobody to watch in these older patients. Uh, but we didn't want to see it growing in size. If we knew it was growing, we wouldn't watch that. Lymph node metastasis, if it's extra thyroid extension. Um, and then the subcapsular location adjacent to the trachea and RLN. Now, that means something to you guys, but that doesn't mean a lot to endocrinologists. And even sometimes it's challenging for you guys because we're talking about the location of the nerve uh, in relation to where the thyroid is in its position not where you guys are rolling it or looking for it or that sort of stuff. So you have to help the endocrinologist understand where these nerves run. Because in our exclusion criteria, we say if it's running next to the nerve, obviously on the left-hand side in the TE groove, but on the right-hand side, as you know, it wraps posterior to the thyroid somewhere in this third down here, not necessarily over here in the TE groove. So when you help endocrinologists decide and when endocrinologists and radiologists are making this decision, nodules that are sitting right on the capsule in the TE groove or right on the capsule in the posterior inferior lobe are probably not ones that you want to watch um, because it's just really hard to know where the nerve is down there. So we teach the endocrinologists and people radiologists that the ideal patient, you can't find many of these, but if you can find them, the thyroid cancer sitting out there, there's a ton of normal tissue around it or here in these locations. We're a lot more liberal watching anterior because we figure if we're wrong, it's gonna be strap muscles and you guys can fix that for me. That if it does sort of invade a little bit outside the thyroid and gets a strap muscle, you'll get a complete gross resection of that. So we're, we're willing to watch things anteriorly, but ones that are sitting on the trachea, particularly where RLNs may be running, we're, deem those inappropriate for now because the last thing you want to do is to lose a nerve while you're watching. Now, in addition to the tumor characteristics, there's also medical team characteristics because there's no question to do this, 
you need good ultrasonographers. And it's not only good ultrasonographers, they have to understand what we're asking them. Yeah, it's not enough just to tell me a three-dimensional size of the nodule. I need to know the location. I need them to tell me, do they think it's pushing on the capsule or invading the capsule? That's a difficult thing to know, but they have to be able to help me that. They have to be able to do really good lymph node evaluations with it as well and have some tracking system. Now, the most interesting group of this to me was these patient characteristics, um, because we quickly learned uh, that there were some patients that completely wanted to watch, and there were other patients that completely wanted surgery. Uh, one of Dr. Shahaz and mine's favorite patient was a nurse that we took care of. Uh, on a Thursday morning, she found out she had a nodule. Uh, by lunchtime, she had talked cytology into biopsying it. And by Thursday evening, we knew pulmonary it was papillary cancer. She showed up to our clinic on Friday morning in PO just in case Ashok could do her surgery before lunch. Um, do you think she's a good candidate for watching? Probably not. Uh, I asked her about it. She pointed out she'd been watching for 18 hours and she was pretty much done watching. Um, but she was dedicated. And we all see those, right? Uh, you guys see them. They're the patients that keep canceling on you. Uh, they keep coming back and they cancel their visit. They, well, I'm going to schedule surgery and they come back and they see three other surgeons and they're not. So there's this group of patients that sort of think differently about this. And I was telling this story up at Harvard years ago, and uh, Pam Hartspan is an endocrinologist at Harvard. Um, if you haven't seen this book, uh, you should look at it. It, it. it helps us understand so much about how patients think about stuff. Um, Pam has done medical grand rounds down here. And if you just put her name in your medical mind, you can even YouTube a 50 minute video. And what her and her husband, Jerry Gropman had described is how patients make medical decisions that they describe maximalist and minimalist. You probably have already decided which one that you are. So maximalists want to be ahead of the curve. Why wait? More is better. A chance to operate is a chance to cure. Don't let the skin stand between you and what the problem is. That's the maximalist mentality. Minimalist, now wait a minute, less is more. That, you know, I'm always the complication. Something bad always happens to me. And people will make these minimalist or maximalist decisions, not just for cancer, but in all aspects of their life. Um, they're the patients whose cholesterol gets one point above normal and they want to be put on a statin yesterday, right? And then there's the patients like me that are more minimalist, that my cholesterol is 100 points too high, and I'm negotiating with you. I swear, doc, I'll get on a diet. I'll, I'll get on my exercise. Just, just don't put me on anything. Diabetics, BMI. It turns out that that way they think about things runs through the entire course. And so one of the things that I quickly try to find out when I'm discussing this in the room is whether the patient is more a maximalist or a minimalist. Now, to be honest with you, they generally sort themselves out because the maximalists bypass me, go straight to Dr. Shaha, and I see him after surgery. So surgeons will go, well, everybody wants a surgery. Well, yeah, they're selecting you guys. And guess who I see? The minimalists come see me because you guys all say, well, you need an operation, but if any moron's going to watch you, it's probably Tuttle. So go over there and see if they'll watch you. Or patients get on YouTube and seek us out. So it's interesting to see how they sort themselves out. Now, one of the things that we realized, even though we developed this ideal, appropriate, inappropriate system for papillary microcarcinomas, this could also apply to how we do lobectomies. Um, and what's that decision-making process we do with lobectomies? Because we're going to have the same ideas about tumor characteristics, the medical team, and the patient characteristics. But there's two other key pieces that fall into the puzzle here. Um, and patients have to understand I'm not going to know whether they're an ideal candidate for a lobectomy until we pass through two other time points. The first three bubbles I know before surgery, but there may be intraoperative findings that you all find that changes the decision and says you are no longer an appropriate person for a lobectomy. Um, and so we routinely, as much as the patients will let us, consent them for both lobectomy and total thyroidectomy. I tell them, we'll tell Dr. Shaha the operation we want. But if he gets in there and there's some really good reason we should do the total thyroidectomy, he'll just make it happen right in that same setting. And most patients are good with that. And then they have to understand that it'll be a couple of weeks after surgery when I review the pathology report before I'll really know whether they're an ideal patient or not. So I actually show patients this sort of diagram. And so you have to understand with me if we're choosing a lobectomy, 
I'm not going to 100% know preoperatively if that's exactly the right operation for you. If you look at the various studies that have been published, the likelihood of you being right about a lobectomy or the patient being right or the likelihood that we don't need anything else is really good, but it can range between 6 and 20%. The 6% is our rate here at Memorial. Uh, the 20% rate is UCSF. Um, we know there's a slight rate of delayed completion thyroidectomy down the road, and multiple papers have shown that if you have to do a completion thyroidectomy down the road or recurrence, these patients do fine. The, the salvage therapy works. So what's the driver? Why is it that some centers have to do a completion thyroidectomy 20% of the time and other people do it 6% of the time? The main driver is the use of radioactive iodine. That if you're a minimalistic use of radioactive iodine like we do at Memorial, then you're gonna do a lot less completion thyroidectomy. And for the endocrinologist, I think most of us would agree if it's a follicular variant with no vascular invasion, a capsular invasion only follicular, no lymph node metastasis, a classic papillary, folks would say fine, that's, that's probably okay for a lobectomy. And then we'd also agree if there's extensive vascular invasion or gross extrathyroid extension or intraoperative findings of clinical in one disease, that would be a completion thyroidectomy. And the vast majority of time that we have to do a completion thyroidectomy, it's related to this extensive vascular invasion. Two or three or four centimeter encapsulated tumor that we thought was fine for a lobectomy. And then we're surprised on the pathology report three or 4% of the time that there's extensive vascular invasion, or it's one of these encapsulated, poorly differentiated that we don't know what to do with. That's usually the driver for us. But at other centers, they'll use these criteria, minor extrathyroid extension or little small lymph node metastasis or any degree of vascular invasion or any little tall cell. If all of those are going to be met with need for radioactive iodine by your endocrinologist, then your completion thyroid rate is going to be higher. So I've encouraged centers to talk with their endocrinologists, talk with their nuclear medicine doctors, and decide out of these criteria, which ones are you going to call inappropriate for lobectomy? And then that would be able to tell you very quickly, what's the rate of completion thyroidectomy you're going to have to do? And if the endocrinologists are really aggressive with radioactive iodine, then you'll find lobectomy a much less pleasing option because you're going to be going back more often. But I think it can be predicted. Well, so how do we go now? So now we've sort of done our initial risk assessment. We've classified people as ideal, appropriate, or inappropriate. You'll notice there's a circle here. These can change. You can be appropriate one day and then inappropriate six months later when you come back or any combination of those. So that's, that's a dynamic iterative process. Now, the other thing that becomes important was truly understanding who's likely to die of thyroid cancer. Now, if I'm honest with you, before this eighth edition, I never used the AJC system for thyroid cancer. The, the seventh edition didn't help me at all. Um, and apparently I whined about it too much and I complained about it too much uh, because when they decided to do the eighth edition, uh, Nancy Perrier called me and said, time for you to stop whining and do something about this. Uh, so join the committee. Let's see if we can work through some of these issues. Uh, they were doing a major rewrite. This was back in 2016. Um, lots of effort, lots of work. We were allowed to rewrite anything that we wanted to. And they divided two separate chapters uh, under uh, Nancy Perrier and Herb Chen, just phenomenal chairs and vice chairs. Uh, and I was lucky to work on the thyroid and differentiated with Lila Morris and uh, Jen Rosen um, and uh, Lori Worth worked on the medullary one. Um, what were the differences? Well, they were the main things that we complained about. In the old system, if you were more than 45, you were old. Um, I was 54 at the time I was writing this, so clearly I couldn't call myself old, so we came up with 55. Um, there were a lot of publications from our center and other places around the world showing that you could raise that cutoff to 55, it would work well. The other things that didn't make sense in the older editions, minor extrathyroid extension was mandated as a stage three. So if, if you had a 46-year-old lady with barely invasion into a strap muscle, that would count as a stage three patient. And yet none of us had ever seen one of those dies. It didn't make sense. They didn't separate out gross from minor extrathyroid extension. And they had this weird thing that if you were older and there was lymph node metastasis, even a millimeter sized lymph node in the upper mediastinum made you stage four. 
So these were okay rules. We were talking about clinical in one disease and gross extra thyroid extension. But as we were diagnosing smaller and smaller stuff, they just upstaged way too many people. And so the goal was to get lots of folks reclassified into the lower stages and to get some separations between the groups. Now, I can't really think through T1, T2, T3, all that combination stuff. So I just made a simple graph that made it easy for me. Um, and it starts with the age of diagnosis. Most of our patients that we take care of are less than 55 years old. If they're less than 55, they're either stage one or stage two. Um, if you got distant mets, you're stage two. If not, you're stage one. You have just learned what you need to know about the eighth edition staging system. For the vast majority of our patients in their 30s and 40s and early 50s, we are not worried about them dying from thyroid cancer. They can have a recurrence. They can have problematic things that need to be fixed in the neck, but the likelihood of dying is dramatically low. Now, in our older patients, the key factor is obviously distant METs and gross extrathyroid extension. Um, this is almost back to the original NIH staging system of confined to the thyroid, local invasion, or distant metastasis. Those are the key factors that drive. From a surgical perspective, you guys have to help us in the op note where it's really clear what structure was involved. Um, because gross extrathyroid extension, if you have it, initially we put strap muscles in stage two. Um, I have every intention of moving that to stage one in the next edition, but that was too big a jump to make on the first one. Um, so we need to know from your guys' op report, was it invading trachea, esophagus, recurrent laryngeal nerve? What was involved? Um, endocrinologists have a really hard time reading through op notes um, that are on average two paragraph and three pages long. Um, or worse, a synoptic report with language we can't understand. So just some, uh, a lot of you guys put a little paragraph right up at the front that just says interoperative findings, dictated not for the judge, not for the lawyer, but for the endocrinologist in nuclear medicine. So we can understand where you were dissecting, where was disease left behind, all of those sort of informations. So this allowed us to be able to stage these folks. Uh, this is work that ASHOC did. Here's, here's a bunch of our patients, I don't know, 4,000 or so, from the surgical database that Ian Ganley um, and Jayton had put together over here. If you look in the seventh edition, look how many people we had in stage four, nearly 300 people, stage three, 500 people. Um, and even with memorials bias, that's not what our clinics look like. But now if you look in the eighth edition, the vast majority of patients are stage one. There's a smaller number of stage two and a smaller number of stage three and stage four. This is more what our clinic feels like. If you think about the thyroid cancer clinics you run, the vast majority of patients are going to be stage one and stage two. It's the handful of patients that have gross extra thyroid extension into trachea, esophagus, that sort. We all remember them, but they're the smaller number. And Julianne Sosa took the SEER data with 64,000 patients, classified them by seventh and eighth edition. This is why the seventh edition didn't help me. The ones, twos, and threes all looked alike. Um, I didn't need a staging system to tell me distant Mets were bad. But in the eighth edition, we're starting to get some separation where one is a little different from two, is a little different from three, is a little different from four. And remember, we've got smaller number of patients in here. And despite the smaller number of patients, we've been able to identify those patients that are really doing poorly. So the eighth edition, I actually find helpful. Um, for the ones of you that do a ton of thyroid cancer, you won't use it because intrinsically, you know it's the gross extra thyroid extension, it's the distant metastasis patients that do poorly. But for the people that don't do a lot of thyroid cancer, this allows them to identify if there are threes and fours, they are ones that probably should be helped out outside of the usual community setting. A disease management team probably should be involved in this smaller group of patients. Now, as I said, we've moved most of the people's risk of dying down to stage one or stage two, and the issue then became, how do we deal with this risk of recurrence? Um, and up until you know, sort of the late 1990s, early 2000s, uh, there really wasn't a good risk of recurrence system. Now, if I'm honest with you, um, we, we, I completely stole this low, intermediate, and high risk. Um, for you guys that have uh, heard Dr. Shaha lecture before, he talked about the good, the bad, and the ugly. So the good, the bad, and the ugly. But apparently that was trademarked by Hollywood. And I know the ATA wouldn't use the good, the bad, and the ugly. So I just took his classifications and renamed them low, intermediate, and high and took complete credit for it. 
Um, highly recommend that to the trainees if you can find a way to do that. It's worked great for me and it's why I'm giving this talk this morning. So here's the low risk. So the low risk, what we did, Brian Haugen and I put this together for the 2006 guidelines. And we said, look, as a first step, let's define the low risk and let's define the high risk uh, such that nobody would argue with those two groups. And then let's put everybody else in intermediate. So in the low risk group, classic papillary confined to the thyroid, no tumor invasion, no vascular invasion, everybody would say, yep, that's low risk. We're comfortable with that. High risk, here's our same definitions, gross extrathyroid extension, incomplete resection, distant metastasis, really inappropriate TG elevations. Um, and we put everybody else in the intermediate risk. Steve Sherman, when we were doing this in 2006, in 2006 warned the guidelines committee. He said, look, you need to understand, if you let Mike away with this, he'll spend the next 15 years taking people out of the intermediate risk category. Uh, they didn't get an intermediate because they belong there. They got an intermediate because when you do baby steps and you try to change paradigms, I find it easier to have people to agree at the goalpost on the end, agree with what's low, agree with what's high, and then just leave everybody else in the middle. And sure enough, that's what we did over the next sort of 10 years, our group and multiple other groups, where we moved away from this concept that risk stratification for recurrence is three boxes. It's not three boxes. It's a continuum of risk. Uh, biology is a continuum of risks that, yeah, there are intermediate risk patients that have a risk of recurrence of uh, 8% or 10%. And then there's intermediate risk to have patients a recurrence of almost 30%. So within this intermediate class, there's sort of a sliding scale of where these might be. But we took the ones that everybody agreed to. So here's papillary microcarcinomas, a one or 2% recurrence rate. Everybody agreed that was low risk. The Europeans call that very low risk. And then we said, okay, what other tumors also have a one or 2% recurrence rate? Um, and if the tumors have that same one or 2% recurrence rate, I don't care what they're named and I don't care what we thought before, the biology says their recurrence rate is the same as a papillary microcarcinoma. And so they got moved to low risk. And that's what led to in 2015, expanding the definition of low risk. So these little small microscopic lymph nodes, the at the time, this is now NIFT-P. This wasn't called NIFT-P at the time, but these intrathyroidal encapsulated follicular variants of papillary cancer, we moved into that low risk. Uh, follicular cancers with only capsular invasion. So there were, these carried that same risk. And because everybody had agreed that two or 4% was low risk, anything that had that same risk category could be moved into that group. Now, we knew by working on the ATA risk and the AJC system, we had just a little bit of a problem. In the older patients, there's a pretty good correlation between stage and ATA risk. That the stage one patients are pretty much low risk, the stage two are intermediate, the stage three and fours is where the high risk comes in. But if you've been following with me and you think about these younger patients, that the stage twos are gonna be distant metastasis. But if you don't have distant metastasis, you're going to be a stage one, which could be a papillary microcarcinoma, or it could be a Herthel cell carcinoma. You just scraped off the trachea, left gross residual disease behind. That would still be stage one because there's no distant mets at diagnosis. And that was going to be a problem because we knew that these ATA high-risk patients within stage one were likely to do more poorly. Um, but it turns out when you look at all of these stage one patients, this is our tumor data here that Dr. Ghaznavi did with me, nearly 5,000 patients, there's only 300 of them that are that very ATA high risk. So as a group, stage one looks great because they're diluted out with all of these people that are going to do good. But if you say, well, what happens to this ATA high risk group? And in Sunna's data, what she showed was in the stage ones, yeah, we had great survival, disease-specific survival, uh, but the ATA high risk had a little bit worse, which is what we would expect. And if you look by age, the older ones had a little bit worse. So when you're using the AJC system and their stage one, uh, if they're also ATA high risk, put that as a red flag. That, that's a problematic patient. They're not going to do as well as the average stage one. So when you put that combination of stage one and ATA high risk together, um, this was different for me because we had always thought about those as sort of separate. The AJCC was the risk of death and the ATA was the risk of recurrence. 
And I realized we had to sort of merge those together. Yeah, we want to do ATA and we want to do AJCC, but for an individual patient, we have to merge those so that that red flag of whatever AJC stage it is, if they're also ATA high risk, that flags somebody that's probably going to do less well than their overall group. Now let's finish with this. Um, so that's cool because we've now negotiated nearly the first six weeks in the life of a thyroid cancer patient. They've had their nodule, they've had their biopsy, they've had their surgery. We've done their initial risk stratification in terms of predicting what's their likelihood of dying, what's their likelihood of recurrence, and then where do we go from there? We use all of that information to kind of get us down a pathway. And back in about oh, late 2008, 2009, 2010, Several groups around the world, our group, Furio Pacini's group, Fernanda Weissman's group down in Brazil, were all thinking about this concept of how do we change things over time? And this language has come to be response to therapy or delayed risk stratification or dynamic risk stratification, ongoing risk assessment. Charlie Emerson from Boston was the editor of Thyroid when we uh, submitted this paper for publication. Uh, and Charlie is a sailor on the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, and when he read the paper, he said, I get it. It's like when I decide to sail to Martha's Vineyard, if I, I've got a plan in mind, but depending on the wind and depending on how things are changing, I may need to adjust my plan accordingly. Now, we're all used to doing this. We've done this forever. We, we, if the thyroid globulin values were going up, what do we tell the patients? Well, we're worried about that. You're moving in the wrong direction. Or if they're going down really good, you say, you're doing great. Or you get a follow-up neck ultrasound, it doesn't show anything. And you've just six months before done an operation for papillary with extensive N1B disease. What do you say? Well, you're doing great. We're really moving in the right direction. So all of those terminologies that we were using was really sort of adjusting our risk estimates over time. Um, and our idea was that we would start with that AJCC, we would start with the ATA risk, we'd plan the first year or two of what the journey would look like, and then every time we'd get data in, we would readjust the risk stratification. So this had to be a dynamic process. Michael Ye, who you guys know from, uh, from California, uh, Michael was with me in the back of a taxi one time and said, here's how I describe your uh, dynamic risk stratification system. He said, I tell patients the first time I meet you, the picture is a little bit fuzzy. And then every time I find some more information, the picture gets a little bit more clear. And so with Michael's permission, by the time I'd landed back here in New York, I had a slide called the focus of yay, because it sounded like some great Chinese proverb. Um, and Mike's actually let me publish this because it, it really sort of explains to the patient what the picture is going to look like. So we needed some naming. Uh, Martin Schlumberger from uh, Paris said that I took old concepts and I gave them new names and he could not be more right. But we needed a naming system. We needed a nomenclature to be able to describe this. So I wanted to be able to describe how you were doing every time you came back to see me, whether it's six weeks after surgery, two years after surgery, 35 years after surgery. I know what your ATA risk was. I know what your AJCC risk, that's your pretest probability. I can't change that. That's the way you were born. But every time you come back, we'll revise how you're doing. And we came up with these four words. One was an excellent response, which is essentially remission. Uh, biochemical incomplete response, these thyroglobulin levels, but we can't find any structural disease. So it's biochemical persistent disease. Structural incomplete disease. Um, I could not have the discussion one more time about what was recurrence or persistent disease. I was tired of writing recurrence size persistent in my paper. And so we just called it structurally incomplete. It's no judgment. It just says you have structural disease that I can find, um, whether now or before surgery, after surgery. And then in this last group, we called this indeterminate. Um, I had originally in the early papers, I called this acceptable response. And I actually liked that terminology better because I figured if you told the patient it was acceptable, they would say, OK, maybe that's a B on the test. It's not an A, but you're probably going to keep watching me if it's acceptable. Uh, the guidelines committee, when we put this in the ATA guidelines in 2009, told me that my acceptable term was too judgmental. It, it implied that the patient shouldn't do anything. And I said, I know it took me a year to find that word. I chose that word on purpose. That's what I wanted it to be. But they wanted it to be less judgmental. So they, they asked me if we could change it to indeterminate response. So you just can't classify them into one of the other three categories. 
they don't stay there forever. After you follow them for a while, those nonspecific thyroid bed nodules, if they don't change, you can eventually call excellent. TG numbers gradually go down. And so we've been really pleased to see now there's 30 or 40 papers published from all over the world, from every sort of academic practice, clinical practices, big practice, and reliably these uh, responses predict outcomes as we would have expected to. That if you have an excellent response, the risk of recurrence, here's that same three, 4% recurrence. This is what we see in clinic. Uh, we don't see a 30% risk of recurrence in clinic, right? I mean, that would be one out of every three thyroid cancer patients having recurrence. Now, in the N1B patients and in some of the higher risk patients, maybe, biochemical incompletes, most of these, a lot of these just spontaneously get better. Their thyroid globins, if you do nothing, will trail down over time. The structural incompletes, this is where the action is. Nearly all of the deaths from thyroid cancer come from the structural incomplete group, either because of unresectable disease in the neck or distant metastasis or multiple structural recurrences. This is the group that we really have to focus on if we're going to make the biggest difference. And out of these indeterminate, about 80% turn out to be benign, but about 20% will develop disease in that category. So what's the logical application? Well, if you've got people that have an excellent response, you got to back off the intensity of their follow-up. They don't need TSH as a minus three anymore. Um, I had a graph one time that uh, showed a theoretical patient flying from California every six months for two years, and then once a year, um, taking a taxi from JFK over to Memorial, staying in Memorial. And uh, we looked at what their actual overall survival would be for that kind of intense follow-up uh, versus if they never came back to see me. Um, and it turns out more people died of coming to New York than died of thyroid cancer. So when you're doing long-term follow-up, you got to make sure you're helping more people than you're hurting. And particularly with ultrasounds, with a false positive rate of nearly 35%, if we keep doing well-meaning ultrasounds in this group that are probably cured, um, all we're going to find by and large is non-specific findings and not helpful. So I'm trying to wean endocrinologists off the ultrasound um, onto some new concept that's been forgotten about called physical exam, um, because apparently at Memorial, before we plugged in the first ultrasound, we followed people with physical exam for 50 years, and we had 99% survival rates. Uh, finding all this minimal residual disease didn't improve survival rates. It just increased our surgery. Well, biochemical incompletes, watched these are most of the ones that we'd watch. The structural incompletes, this is where the ones we need to spend a little bit more time on. Some of these require some additional treatments. Some of these can be followed with observation. And this really came about because there, our ability to find structural disease went through the roof over the last 20 years. Um, because we now have TG assays. Our TG assay now reads down to 0.1. So apparently I can't cure anybody anymore. Um, but in the good old days when the TG was less than one, my cure rate was awesome. Visits were short. They asked about the kids. I told them about my summer vacation. Uh, now, uh, the, the one yesterday, the TG went from 0.1 last year to 0.2 this year. Um, and they brought me in a bunch of our papers on doubling time. So the TG had doubled. And that was a good 30-minute discussion of my life explaining 0.1s versus 0.2s. But we're able to find these low-level disease now. And what we've tapped into is this huge reservoir of subclinical cancer not just the papillary microcarcinoma story with observation, but all of these small volume disease in the thyroid bed, small volume lymph node metastasis, and in fact, small volume distant metastasis. Now, the guidelines have sort of backed into this because if you comb through the guidelines, there are several examples of where we say, you know, we can detect something, but it doesn't need to be treated. For years, we tried to get you guys out of having to operate on these really tiny lymph nodes that I can't imagine how you guys find in a central neck that's already been dissected or a lateral neck chasing down these little three, four, five millimeter lymph nodes. With the oncologist, we probably watch more distant mets than we treat, despite all of the TKIs and redifferentiation therapies, uh, finding aspiration for these active surveillance folks. Um, and so with Ali Al-Azrani, Ali is the chief of endocrine at King Faisal, and he did a sabbatical with us here for a few months with Jim and I. Um, and we spent a long time talking about what should be treated and what could be watched. Um, and so we came up with this language that we put in JCN a couple years ago, talking about what's detectable from what's actionable. 
detectable findings from actionable findings. And you'll see on the graph on the right, uh, my bias is that the vast majority of what we find is really non-actionable. Very, very small volume lymph node metastasis, very, very small volume primary tumors. TG is a 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. I just don't think we're helping those people. On the other hand, we don't want the pendulum to swing too far. There are clearly some patients that would benefit from a surgery, would benefit from radioactive iodine. Um, and as we looked at it, particularly from the structural disease thing, and from your guys' perspective about which lymph nodes do I watch that are clearly metastatic and which ones do we operate on? Which distant metastasis do we watch? Which ones do we intervene? It really rolled down to these sort of five categories. Um, I refer to this as my pilot's checkoff list because you guys know if you fly, it doesn't matter how experienced a pilot is. If they've been flying for 25 years, there's a checkoff list they go through every time before they take off on the plane. And so I try to do this myself every time I see one of these structural disease that might or might not need to be treated. What's the size, three-dimensional volume? What's the growth rate? Well, obviously, uh, most of the time use the doubling time of the cancer. Uh, what's the location? Is it causing symptoms or is it likely to cause symptoms? And what's the patient preference? And I'll go through all five of these with the patients because sometimes small sizes that are growing in a bad location need to be taken care of. There are times we send you guys to find those eight or nine millimeter lymph nodes that just happen to be sitting right where we think the recurrent laryngeal nerve is. Uh, and making that decision, is the cancer more likely to hurt the nerve or is the surgeon more likely to hurt the nerve? And how do we have that discussion? And that's where that patient preference comes in as well. So as we're looking at that sort of structural incomplete, as we think through these issues, these are the issues that we think through with the patient. And from a practical standpoint, what I'll often tell the patients and what I tell endocrinologists um, is if you're seeing a little lymph node and you're trying to decide, should I biopsy it? Is it metastatic thyroid cancer? Should I treat it? Uh, to ask your surgeon, if it got bigger and pick out some number like 25%, if I watch for the next six months, if it got 25% bigger, would it invade anything important? And would it make your surgery harder? That's the two questions I need you to answer for me. Would it invade anything? Um, and would it make your surgery harder? And if it's going to invade something or if it's going to make the surgery harder, then that would lean toward us doing something now. If the answer is no, it may get a little bit bigger, not going to hurt anything. We can watch for a little bit. As long as it meets these five criteria, then we would watch. So let me finish with this and then we'll uh, give you some time to answer some questions. So risk stratification now begins from the very moment we find the nodule. This is before we do a biopsy. We're making decisions about should we biopsy or should we not biopsy? Uh, is it helpful to make the diagnosis or not? Leading up to what's the extent of surgery? Lobe versus total, total versus central neck, central neck versus lateral neck, uh, resection of the trachea, resection of the, you know, all of those decisions, that risk stratified decision, what's part of it. Then after surgery, we'll take a pause and say, okay, let's look at the risk of death, let's look at the risk of recurrence, and let's plan what would be a logical follow up in terms of intensity of follow up. Do I do ultrasound? Do I do CT? Do I do PET scan? If they're going to recur, what's the likely location of recurrence? If they're going to recur, what's the likely time frame of recurrence that would guide all of those early decision makings that we would do? And then as new data comes in, we adjust that based on this language. So somebody could be stage three, intermediate risk, and now a structural incomplete. Stage three, intermediate risk, structural incomplete. And we all have sort of a vague idea about what that patient's going to look like and how we would be able to follow them forward. So I hope this has kind of given you an overview uh, about what this might look like, about sort of framework and language that we can use so that we can talk with each other um, and identifying particularly for me, the structural incomplete response, uh, how best we tailor the initial surgeries to minimize having a structural incomplete response. And then even more difficult deciding if we have the structural incomplete response, when do we intervene? How do we intervene? Surgery, external beam radiation, TKI, all of those other things in our uh, hands. Thanks very much. So thank you, Dr. Tuttle. That was really a, an amazing lecture and an amazing uh, perspective and way to put this together. It certainly has evolved a lot uh, for a lot of reasons. 
uh, over a lot of years. Our, our early detection and societal changes and our better understanding and our changing uh, uh, our changing indications for things. So uh, that was really a tour de force. Thank you so much. Of course, you've published a lot of this thinking, so the world has access to it, which is great, but it's also really nice to have you right here in our New York community. Uh, so uh, thank you for, uh, for, 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 we're glad you're here and thank you for being here this morning. So we'll open it up for questions or comments. Uh, Mike, thanks a lot. That was great. Um, I had a question about active surveillance. Um, when, you know, obviously, you know, you have a lot of patients on active surveillance. When do you decide that you're going to send back to the surgeon? Um, yeah. You know, so, yeah. So we, we now have about 506 or 507 patients on active surveillance, um, less than one and a half centimeters. The, the first couple hundred were all less than a centimeter. And the ones since then have all been between one and 1.5 centimeters. Um, I think we're definitely seeing fewer of the sub-centimeter nodules being biopsied these days and a move toward the bigger. So with uh, Akira Miyachi, we've talked a lot about this. So um, the, the indications to move toward a surgery um, in its simplest is if the nodule increases by three millimeters or more in maximum dimension, because that's, the, that's usually the measurement variation, plus or minus three millimeters, you can't tell. Um, or if it increases 50% in volume. My, my preference is to follow them as volume because I'm trying to get endocrinologists to think about these as three-dimensional structures and not just as a nine millimeter single structure, right? I need them to think like you guys, three-dimensional structure, where's the nerve, where's the capsule and that kind of stuff. Um, now, to be fair, we've had about 10% grow, which is exactly what Akira said we would do. Um, and out of that 10%, only half have gone to surgery. Um, the half that have gone to surgery are the ones that have changed within the first couple of years. Um, their doubling time is two or three years. Um, and pretty much every time you do the ultrasound, it's like a millimeter bigger, but it takes you two or three ultrasounds to see. So you're 18, 24 months. Almost all of those guys have accepted surgery and gone to surgery. Um, a few of them haven't uh, because they totally, they've been all over Dr. Google and they understand it's very anterior and it's on the capsule. Uh, one of them grew from six to nine millimeters and I told her she needed surgery. And she said, well, if I never met you before and it was nine millimeters, would you watch me now? Uh, to which I said, uh, I hate you. Um, and <laughs> yes, I would, right? That'd be the right answer. Yes, I would watch. So we watched. Um, the other ones that I'm watching are uh, ones that have changed over five or six years. Uh, their doubling time is four or five or six years. They're clearly growing. And in those guys, I say, all right, you're 55. Do you want surgery when you're 55 or when you're 65? We, you know, we, we, when would you rather have that? So we lean toward that. A lot of those guys that are growing, they're using the observation programs, what I call a bridge. Um, I've got a couple of police officers who are going to retire in a couple of years and a couple of professional voice users are going to retire in three or four years. So th they know they're going to need the surgery, but they're using it as a bridge to a better time. Um, and then I've got a few that are pretty smart that are waiting for us to figure out RFA and lasers and microwaves uh, that they, they think they want to be treated. They just don't want a surgery. They, they want their normal thyroid in there. And so they're watching how everybody's working on ablations that we'd always traditionally done for benign nodules and are now starting to offer under a research project for, uh, for papillary cancers. I mean, that was my next question. I wanted to get your thoughts on ablation since I think that's like kind of the hot topic at this point. It is, so I'm, I'm totally biased um, from, for uh, just disclosure. Uh, we're working with a company called Alesta from Italy um, because Memorial's never seen a test or a treatment that we think is too expensive. So we're gonna develop lasers here. Um, the, the group at Columbia are already doing uh, radio frequency ablation. Um, the, the, for the details, uh, I wrote a editorial in thyroid sometime the end of last year uh, with uh, Akira Miyachi from Japan and uh, somebody from Denmark, um, the Laszlo Hedges, because there were two or three papers that came out talking about ablation, not only for benign nodules, but also for thyroid cancer. For benign nodules, Europe's been ahead of us for 10 years. There's no question that it works. It's safe. They know how to do it. But they get like 50, 60% shrinkage of these big nodules. That's fine for cosmetic purposes. But for thyroid cancer, you got to show that you can actually kill not only the nodule, but a little safety margin around the nodule. Um, there's a couple papers about to come out, most of which from China, that now have some five and 10 year follow up of uh, either radio frequency ablation or microwave 
for these papillary microcarcinomas, and you would expect the patients to do fine. Because uh, honestly, they're going to do fine if you do nothing. Right. right. Uh, so if you, if you treat people that the cancer is never going to hurt them, then you can publish <laughs> 10 years later the cancer never hurt them. Uh, so I, I think we're, to my mind, using the ablation in the cancer setting right now, it's still experimental. Right. Although I think within a year or maybe two, um, it's going to be right out there. Now, a word of caution, I don't want to take all 500 patients I'm watching and turn them all into laser patients. I mean, that, that's, that, you know, that's just over-treatment in a different way. Um, the ones I'm going to do are the ones that were dedicated to watching, and they're slowly growing. Cool. That'd be a good group. Um, there's a group of maximalists that can't figure out if they're more scared of their cancer or more scared of losing their thyroid. Um, and so those would also be a good group. So I think most of my active surveillance folks are going to stay on active surveillance, but the ablation will cut into the ones of you guys that are doing lobectomy. Um, that, that, because patients often, as you know, want to be treated. They're the patients that ask you, can you cut out just my cancer, right? When you start telling them about lobectomy, they're not worried about the rest of the thyroid. Um, most of the maximus, though, as you know, like a lot of them choose total thyroidectomy because they ask, could there be cancer on the other side or could there be cancer you can't see? And so I think it'll be a relatively small group and it'll be the maximalist group that want a treatment, but they only want that little focus taken care of. So I, I tell patients within a year or two, I think this is going to be a very viable clinical option for them to use. Um, particularly the 20 and 30 year olds that have, you know, little five or six millimeters that it's hard to envision watching that for 80 years, right? I mean, just even me, I'm aggressive. They're not going to be my problem after 15 years because I'm going to go fishing in Kentucky. Uh, but in those, in those young people, that might be a nice way to be able to kill the cancer. Um, I, I've had three or four of my patients that were following with observation uh, one of them needed a kidney transplant and he couldn't get his kidney transplant until Ashok did a lobectomy. And one of them wants to be a kidney donor, uh, but they won't let her be a donor because she has active cancer. So, you know, there's, there's a few of those things. They don't want their thyroid taken out, but it's causing lifestyle issues. I've had a couple people have a hard time getting in uh, life insurance um, because they, you know, they ask, when's the last time your cancer was treated? And the answer is, Never. Um, so th there are some social situations like that that we may end up treating as well. Thanks. Yeah, the, the individual patient variation is quite remarkable in, in terms of what risk people are willing to, you know, it's like, the, it's like the lottery, you know, question versus driving your car on the freeway every day, you know, risk. People don't necessarily make rational choices about short term, long term uh, risk and, and people, it's individual variation. Yeah, I, I agree totally, Mark. When I, when I started this observation thing, I was actually developing decision aids and I was developing videos so I could educate these poor people how they could watch. They weren't interested in that at all. Uh, they came to me. They wanted the good housekeeping seal that said it's okay to watch. They, they weren't asking me about surgery. Um, so it sort of changed my approach. I, I think it's wrong for me to talk a, minimal, a maximalist into watching um, and probably wrong to talk a minimalist into surgery. Um, minimalist, if they really need surgery, most of the time will do it because you can imagine people come see me that no way on this earth they should be watched, right? They're invading a strap muscle and they've got lateral neck lymph node metastasis and they begin negotiating with me. Most of the time I can convince a minimalist why this is a necessary surgery. Um, but you got the few that are just out there that, you know, won't accept anything and it's, they're, they're a challenge. Dr. Keel, you had a question? I, I did, Michael. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Um, my question is, for: do you foresee for um, uh, stage one low-risk patients guidelines for post-treatment uh, surveillance uh, that will um, help to decrease the intensity of that surveillance and, and uh, sort of um, recognize the, the uh, psychic distress that patients experience during that period as a morbidity that can be avoided and, and the other issues in terms of expense and so forth. Yeah, I, I do, Bill. I mean, because I, I think that's, you know, Anna Saka from Canada has published several papers that show that well-meaning doctors doing extra ultrasounds and extra scans are actually just causing more anxiety. It's not reassuring to the patients. Um, so I would love to have the ATA guidelines have a low risk with an excellent response. Say the only thing you need is a physical exam um, and maybe measure a thyroglobin every three or four years. Your primary care doctor can do that. 
Um, so I, I'm not on the ATA guidelines this time because they finally threw me off after three times. Um, <laughs> but lots of what we're writing about now with like the false positives on the ultrasound and over suppression. Um, I, I don't see any reason why those ATA, the, you know, you start with the easiest ones first, right? The ATA low risk that have an excellent response to therapy. Uh, you know, that group has a risk of recurrence at less than 1%. And you're not going to find it for at least five or six years. Um, so I'm hoping they'll tell us really to back off. Uh, they clearly do. And like the British Thyroid Association guidelines, right? Even, even for nodule and other things, they're better at that than we are. So I really hope they tell us to back off on those patients um, and either be followed with local endocrinologists. But honestly, I'm sending most of my patients back to their either the endocrinologist they came from or if they've got a primary care doctor. Um, our leukemia guys do that after five years. They're given a card that says, measure a CBC every this once in a while or whatever. So there's this trend in oncology that when you get patients down a simple pathway that doesn't require specialized stuff, that patients and their local doctors can follow those pathways. So I'll be really disappointed if they don't really draw back on that and, and allow us to be able to risk stratify that better bill. Thank you. So we have, uh, we're running out of time, but we have a, one more raised hand, which is Dr. Benucci. Hi, hi. Excellent talk. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question about genetics because at this point I'm having a lot of patients that I'm treating very minimalistically and then they come back and they're BRAF positive because we're checking everybody. So I changed nothing, but it gives me pause. And my question to you is what's the future and when are we going to have guidelines on how to incorporate BRAF into the whole equation, for example? It's very common. Oh, yeah. And that's such a great question, Dr. Minucci. Yeah, because we often know now, right, because of the thyroseek or whatever the things are. So just a couple of things to think about. Um, one, if you look at every papillary microcarcinoma that's ever been taken out, uh, somewhere between 60 and 65 percent of them are BRAF V600E positive, 50 to 60 percent. Um, and yet we know that like 90 percent don't change and they do well. Um, the, so the BRAF, it doesn't trump size. It doesn't trump anatomy. Um, it's why on the continuum of risk, I actually put a BRAF tumor in low risk, small tumors, BRAF positive has a risk of recurrence of 1%. Um, the way I look at the, the molecular mutations, when you start doing BRAF plus TERT or RAS plus TERT or RAS plus PK3 or, or P53, they modify the ATA risk and they modify the AJCC. Uh, when I did the AJCC, I couldn't find any molecular stuff that would trump from a stage one to a stage two. But if you look like in the stage four distant metastasis, the stage fours that are BRAF do worse than the ones that don't have BRAF. The stage four BRAF plus TERT do worse than the ones that don't. So what I'm hoping is that this time the guidelines use those molecular findings as modifiers of ATA risk and of AJCC. Just like we said, you know, you, it, it's not the ace of spade. A BRAF is not the same as invading the trachea, but it's also not to be ignored. So I use it to slightly modify. And if you've already got somebody that's low risk, uh, maybe BRAF helps you find the most aggressive goldfish in the bowl, but they're still goldfish. So they're low risk, but they're still down there. So I'm, I'm really hoping that the new guidelines will, will provide some more guidance on that. Um, and then the last thing I'll say, and I'll quit, is that just because you can define risk doesn't mean more therapy does anything. Remember, oncology's made this mistake forever. We can, we can identify people at very high risk of having bad outcomes and well-meaning more aggressive surgery or well-meaning radioactive iodine or well-meaning whatever doesn't necessarily mean you're going to help with that. So it, we, we need to disconnect a little bit being able to identify risk and that meaning that more therapy is necessarily good or bad when you do the studies to find those out. Well, thank again, you. Dr. Hunter, thank you very much for uh, a fantastic lecture. Thanks to our, our guests, uh, some of whom from around the world have uh, joined us today.